Frank Herbert's Dune has been adapted once again for the big screen, and you've never seen the story play out like this. To help unpack part one of this sci-fi masterpiece in the making, here are some of the small details you might have missed in Dune. One of the most surprising parts of Dune that goes relatively unnoticed is that there aren't any computers in the universe, or at least not as we know them. Sure, there's basic technology that relays information for the user, but there's no smart tech or artificial intelligence to assist with space travel, and absolutely no processing machines capable of executing computation. Even the ornithopters, those bird-like planes flown by the Atreides, rely entirely on the reaction speed, eyesight, and navigational skills of their pilots. We even see Paul at one point using a paracompass, which Duncan Idaho describes as a clever piece of clockwork, to straighten his path through the desert. To put it simply, the technology in Dune feels awfully analog. It's a science fantasy aesthetic lifted straight from the source material, which went on to leave a serious imprint on the genre, inspiring legions of imitators, most famously George Lucas's Star Wars. But why? Society is clearly very advanced thanks to the huge spaceships used by the Great Houses to ship troops and spice across the universe. This is a truly interstellar civilization set in the far future, and with not as much as an Apple III computer to show for it. There's a reason for that. Thousands of years before the events of Dune, humans waged war across the universe with a malevolent AI called Omnius, who rose to take advantage of the fact that humanity had become reliant on thinking machines. The 2002 novel Dune the Butlerian Jihad, published after Frank Herbert's death and written by his son Brian Herbert and author Kevin J. Anderson, kicks off a trilogy about this crusade to free the universe from the malevolent computers that had penetrated every facet of modern life. There are workarounds for the modern citizen in Dune, however, although it's never directly explained in the film. Thufir Hawat and Piter De Vries are both mentats. Mentats are extremely intelligent people who have been conditioned to hold vast amounts of knowledge and execute advanced computations as flesh and bone replacements for thinking machines. In short, in the universe of Dune, computers are forbidden by interstellar law. Fear might be the mind killer, but the slow blade penetrates the shield. Although the personal shields that Dune's characters use are good for deflecting projectiles, they leave the user vulnerable to slow-moving handheld weapons. House Atreides' weapon master, Gurney Halleck, warns Paul about these vulnerabilities in the training scene early on in the film, and even shows him that immediately going for a killing blow while wearing a shield can still lead to defeat. As he puts it, the slow blade penetrates the shield. This is why fencing and swordplay have become integral skills for soldiers in Dune's universe, while guns and other larger incendiary devices have been mostly relegated to space, ship-to-ship, -ship, and air-to-ground warfare. The swordplay also adds an element of elegance to the universe, making the act of waging war an incredibly personal thing. Outside of their vehicles, soldiers and commanders have to face their opponents directly on the battlefield. Duncan Idaho and Gurney are both incredibly gifted swordsmen, moving their weapons fast enough to catch the enemy off guard, but slow enough to penetrate the shield. It's a delicate dance of violence unique to the combat aesthetic of Dune. Of course, it isn't just swords and knives that can slowly break through the shield. The remotely piloted hunter-seeker can pierce its defenses using a tiny needle filled with lethal venom. Dr. Yue is also seen using a notable slow-moving projectile to drill through Duke Leto's shield, paralyzing him on behalf of Baron Harkonnen. House Atreides is one of the most noble houses in the universe and has plenty of support throughout the Imperium, so it's understandable why the Emperor is scared of Duke Leto and his family. The Atreides name carries weight throughout the galaxy, but why all the bull symbolism? We first see a carving of a man fighting a bull at the site of Paul's grandfather's grave. Leto mentions that his father was killed fighting a bull, so maybe this carving is just a tribute? But then we see a bull's head again hanging in the Atreides palace on Caladan. The totem is important enough for them to box up and take with them to Arrakis. Turns out, this isn't just any old bull. The Seleucan Bull is famous in the history of House Atreides mainly because Leto's father, Paulus Atreides, was killed by one during a bullfighting match. The Seleucan Bull is notorious for its anger and violent temperament, so Paulus clearly enjoyed the wilder side of life. Perhaps Duke Leto kept the head to remind him not to be as headstrong as his father? Very early in the film, we're introduced to an aspect of Paul's character that really makes up the core of the story, though you might not realize it from part one. 
While still on Caladan, Paul is beset by vivid dreams that seem to trouble his mother and attract the attentions of the Bene Gesserit. In these dreams, Paul sees war. He sees Arrakis. He sees the death of Atreides champion Duncan Idaho. He sees a girl in a still suit who looks a lot like Zendaya. As we know from the back half of the movie, all of these dreams come to pass, and Paul ultimately meets the Zendaya-looking Fremen girl named Chani. Do you often dream things that happen just as you dream them? Yes. There's a brief moment in the film related to these visions that's easy to miss. It happens when Paul runs out into the desert to rescue a crew of spice miners under threat of worm sign. Sand kicked up by the approaching worm swirls around Paul and Gurney Halleck, and in that sand we see golden motes flickering, the movie's visual cue for the presence of spice. This is the moment in the film when Paul gets his first large dose of the ambient spice that saturates the deep deserts of Arrakis. The spice awakens Paul's latent powers of prophecy. There's only awakening in my mind. The spice doesn't cause Paul's power of prophecy. That's all the result of the Bene Gesserit breeding program and Jessica's decision to defy her order and bear Duke Leto a son. But its regular application does awaken and sharpen the ability that will become the Atreides' blessing and curse for the next several millennia. The Duke's son sees too much. In one of Paul's waking visions, we see Paul Atreides fighting for Arrakis with the bright blue-on-blue -blue eyes of the indigenous Fremen. While it's no stretch to imagine Paul fighting with the Fremen, considering how part one ends, Paul's eyes are typically brown, so how did this ocular switch happen? As we will no doubt discover in the second half of Villeneuve's adaptation, the blue-on-blue -blue look that's so in vogue in the Fremen's sieges is no genetic marker. It can happen to anyone after prolonged exposure to the spice. The spice is everywhere in the deep deserts of Arrakis. It's in the air the Fremen breathe, the water they drink, they even cook it into their food. Aside from the obvious health benefits, it turns their irises and sclera a glowing shade of blue. When the film ends, Paul tells his mother that his path goes through the desert. If that path is long enough, he's going to wind up with blue eyes, just like in his vision. After the Reverend Mother of the Bene Gesserit pays a visit to Paul on Caladan with a very nasty present, she makes an offhand comment to Jessica that a path has been cleared for them through Arrakis. In hindsight, this might seem like the height of sarcasm, since we know the Reverend Mother was simultaneously conspiring with the Harkonnens to murder most of House Atreides. It's actually a more important line than you might think, as it provides the connective tissue between a few more strange and disparate occurrences throughout the film. Consider Shoutout Mape's religious fervor after presenting Jessica with the Chris knife during what is ostensibly her interview to become a maid. Liette Kynes and Stilgar's suspicion that Jessica and Paul satisfy some kind of prophecy, and that that Paul might be the Fremen Messiah, and Stilgar's use of the term Sayadina, which he applies to Jessica after seeing her Bene Gesserit skills. All of these events are part of the path that the Bene Gesserit cleared for Jessica and Paul. A Bene Gesserit initiative known as the Missionaria Protectiva seeds primitive cultures with Bene Gesserit rituals so that if a sister in trouble stumbles upon them, she might be able to con her way into being revered as a holy woman. The Missionaria Protectiva touched the Fremen, which is why they consider a weirding woman like Jessica to be some kind of anointed priestess. Jessica knows the right words to say to set Shoutout Mapes wailing because Shoutout Mapes' entire faith is largely a construct of the Bene Gesserit. It may seem a cruel tactic, but the Fremen are about to turn this con job on the Bene Gesserit in a big way, so stay tuned. Dune Part 2 can't come soon enough. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.